Welcome to the C.S. Joseph podcast. I'm your host, John, and today I have the honor of being joined by Chris Taylor, also known as Raka, on the Discord. Chris, thanks for coming. Yeah, thanks uh, for having me, man. Of course. And today, um, I'm very excited, and I think you are too, to talk about someone who's quite popular in our culture, has been for some time, and maybe perhaps even more interesting from a psychological perspective. And of course, that's none other than uh, Jordan Peterson, or Dr. Peterson for uh, the affiliates among us. So, um, so we wrote, uh, I wrote an article on Jordan Peterson's octogram about six months ago, back in December. And then we recently, uh, I wrote an article on Robert Greene, which we did a video on. And I decided, you know, let's go back and do a video on Jordan Peterson, uh, who's perhaps maybe one of the most important cultural figures to analyze and to talk about and to understand, um, you know, not just for his sake, but for our own sake as kind of most of us are probably influenced by by him, even if uh, in indirectly. So, so uh, for you, Chris, be, before we jump into the discussion points, I wanted to see if you could give us like a snapshot of what your experience with Peterson is, what you think about him, and maybe his relevance to the psychology, especially you know using the the tools that we do to interpret um, him. Yeah, yeah. So I like a lot of other people. Um, I really found out about Jordan Peterson once he started getting, you know, traction in the media. Um, and that's traction in the case of just getting absolute mud. Um, yeah. And, you know, he's, I mean, I think it's hard to go through any, uh, like, social media, like YouTube feed without running into... Um, at least one of his debates with the cultural issues that we're facing right now. Um, he's he's a really strong voice. Um, whether you agree or disagree with him, he definitely um, is a very strong voice out there um, in opposition to a lot of the ideologies that uh, he he sees as dangerous to kind of the um, the the path towards uh, the path that humanity is taking. And this is one of the interesting things about polarizing figures, like you mentioned, you know, being in conflict often in, in our culture. I think polarizing people in general are the easiest to pigeonhole into, oh, you know, taking a sound bite and there's some hater or some alt right wing person, you know, and, and you know, you're, you're free to your opinion. But I think it is the case that people who are polarizing are often the most sophisticated, but also the easiest to gaslight into being simpletons. And yep. uh, I think that's why doing a video like like this and some content on on him to try and uh, you know take away that the the easy labels uh, can be so valuable to try and understand him. So um, our first point and kind of the big one is uh, why Jordan Peterson is not an INFJ, right? Because if you go online, if you look most anywhere, <laughs> sometimes even within our own community. Uh, there seems to be this built-in narrative that, hey, you know, Peterson's an INFJ. And I ran into the same perception dealing with Robert Greene. And it's interesting, uh, we'll bring up in a couple of minutes, that both Greene and Peterson follow the exact same pattern in terms of how their culture perceives them and then yep. what, their, what their type actually is. So the first thing to, to realize, I, I'm not going to lay out the pros and cons of being an INFJ or an INTP. We, we believe he's an INTP. And there's no question about it in our in our minds. I think if you have any even even a small set of the vectors that we use, it's pretty obvious that he's not not only an INFJ. That that should be the first point, but is is certainly not an INTP. However, if you just use the basic MBTI analysis, right, of of, of you know are they introverted or extroverted, intuitive or or, or sensing, thinking or feeling, judging or perceiving. Um, it makes sense, actually, that a lot of people think he's an INFJ because like Robert Greene, okay, he's, he's probably introverted. He studies a lot. He likes to kind of keep, keep to himself, even though he's kind of social, uh, Jordan Peterson is. Obviously intuitive, obviously abstract, right? I think the hardest one for most people is, is thinking or feeling because he's, he's such this intellectual powerhouse, right? But he's yep. kind. He cries on camera, right? He seems very sensitive uh, at times. 
And then judging, you know, he seems pretty orderly. He's very organized. He's systematic, right? Um, but here's kind of where sociologists can, can help us in so much as uh, those who are intro who are introverts but have a judging hero function are actually perceiver type are actually uh, judging types within the socionic system because in the MBTI system the introverts who are who have a judging hero function are actually uh, are actually J types but the MBTI labels them as P so an INTP with TI hero is actually kind of technically a judger in some ways because they are leading with the judgment of their TI hero right um, yeah. I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about, you know, these these tensions of these perceptions where people are using, they may be using the, the tool correctly, but the tool itself is sort of, is not right, right? Well, well, I think I think that's that's kind of the crux of it. So in any kind of um, science or any kind of system, you're going to have terminologies that are specific to that study or that field. Right. And when you have this psychology where, you know, the, the commonality between a lot of them, the first commonality is, of course, you know, the 16 archetypes. That's the most fundamental, whether you go to 16, uh, whether you go to um, like 16 personalities, MBTI, yeah, socionics, our system, it all, that's, that's a very, very core baseline. Um, most of these systems also, you know, have the eight uh, function stack um, to some degree. Sure. The problem lies also, in addition to, you know, what you kind of went over, there are different systems with differing definitions of what the functions even mean as well. And so I will often see people come into like our community on the discord and they're like, oh, you're so wrong about such and such type. And it's like, okay, if you apply the rules of another system, I can understand that. But you have to go into a system under the understanding that there's a set of definitions in that system. Um, and yeah. so you can never, it's too, all too often I see people trying to like intermingle or hodgepodge different systems rules together. And that's one, one problem. And, and there's, there's two things here. One of them is systems that are independent of each other. And then there's systems that are trying to do the same thing, like our system, Chaser system, and the MBTI, but go about it with either more deep and sophisticated tools or more kind of general paradigms of you know, intuitive or sensing. So for right. Peterson, uh, the reason well, a lot of people think he's an INFJ is because they're not aware that we actually have four sides of our mind and all these other vectors that describe why he may come across a lot more feeling oriented, a lot more uh, compassionate than the stereotypical INTP would, right? Uh, yep. And I know for myself, I've had a lot of INTPs in my life. I feel for them, especially in this issue of, of the stereotype of them as these sort of uh, robots, right? These sort of heartless, all minds, people who, do, who don't care about anyone else, right? And that's just, that really couldn't be further from the truth yep. um, in terms of what they actually care about. So for the INFJ versus the INTP, uh, just like in the Robert Greene video, we talked about uh, the INFJ and the INTP. Are, there's only two types who are introverted and abstract yep. and are an FE user, and that is the INFJ and the INTP. Yep. Just like for the green video, there's only two, two types that are introverted, abstract, and a TE user. That's the INFP and the INTJ. So for Peterson and the INFJ uh, versus the IN, INTP, based on those vectors alone, you know, it, it makes sense that there's those types will have some commonalities, um, yep. especially because the INFJ has SE inferior, so and that's not always on, right? So they can come across like a background type sometimes, and they both have pessimistic FE and optimistic TI, right? So it's like, yep. I, from a sense, you can you can kind of get that. So um, one of the things I wanted to ask you about, specifically about the INFJ versus INTP issue, yeah. uh, is I think one of the things that people are picking up on maybe unconsciously is the deadly sin similarities between these types because lust and gluttony can be express itself in in uh, very similar ways. If you can be gluttonous for something sexual, right, just as you can be lust for something uh, food related potentially. So can right. you uh, give us your thoughts on, on how to separate those in a better yeah. way? 
Um, as far as separating them, the I am not a large fan personally in, in my uh, typing of others of looking at the, the wheels, so to speak, as much as the origins. I think the right. origins are a little more effective, especially since um, the origins are attached to the hero function. That that doesn't really go away. Um, but we have the deadly sins attached to like specific types or specific dyads, um, more specifically, two dyads. But everyone can has a kind of their 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 fingers in the pie of the collective like oh, wheel oh, of deadly sins, right? Yeah. Um. Yeah. So not only yes, you are correct that um, lust is can be conflated with gluttony. Um, if you're trying to distinct them, you really want to go back and follow them back to the origin. So lust is about connection to other people, right? It, or a it is the idea of an experience that is very often shared with others to some to some capacity. Um, whereas gluttony tends to be more literally consumptive, but it can just be about a personal experience. In a sense, in a very, very, very light sense, you could think of it as an extroverted versus introverted, if you would like. Sure. Um, sure. But one is more about um, things rather than people. And that's probably the biggest difference there. Right. Well, and that's what people need to remember. I'll, I'll try and put, uh, put the images of the wheels here. But that, you know, lust for, for us is always in the context of intimacy and connection. Uh, yeah. it, it's 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 about to search out for for someone else's for becoming unified with someone else in some way. Whereas yeah. gluttony is like I'm bored, I want to eat something, or I'm 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 bored, I want to consume some new experience. It's not always food related, right? But uh, it's more in the context of boredom versus loneliness is another I, way of thinking. Of I it. don't I don't. Um, very often it comes across as I don't have enough. There's not enough for gluttony. Um, for for gluttony, yeah. It's right. okay. it's like the the thing I'm I'm looking around me and the things that I have and it's not always like, I mean they are on like an orbit with with greed of course right, right. but it's not always about things like it's that <laughs> where it comes from is that discovery origin, it all ties back to that origin and it's like I am searching for something I am searching for something new that I haven't seen before that I haven't experienced before and Ironically, it very often results in them just consuming the same things over and over again. Um, so this right, this right here is one of the things I would challenge people to, to, to do who still believe he's an INFJ or maybe aren't sure. Part of the point of making these videos and part of the point of doing the Robert Greene video was to show people how powerful the origins and the wheels can be in typing people. So if you look at Peterson and just to think about Okay, intimacy versus discovery. Which one do you think applies more to him? And if you if you just have the either or mindset and take in his his content, think about what he's after. I think you're gonna have a hard time convincing yourself that intimacy is really the apex of what he's pursuing. Uh, yeah. it's, an, it's still there, right? He talks about the importance of relationships and his relationships with his wife and his, you know, et cetera, et cetera. But that I think is in the bigger context of discovery, having a complete life, having a satisfying life, uh, yeah. which is, you know, of course, the crusader secondary origin. Uh, so uh, the INTP secondary quadra origin for the ENTP and the ISFJ. So uh, anyway, so for the INTP of Jordan Peterson, like Carl Jung, like uh, John uh, John Beebe, who we believe is an IN, INTP as well, like uh, Slavoj Zizek, Zizek, who Peterson debated actually, which is a, a quite, kind of a hilarious debate a few years ago, who's also an, IN, an INTP. Peterson is one of these background intellectual guardians, watchers of our, of our race. And just like I talked about Robert Greene being a watcher, all the NP types, that's really their purpose, I think, for humanity is to be a watchman. And that's a little question I have for you being an, an NP, but if, if people don't know, Chris is an ENFP. Uh, can you talk a little bit about that theme of 
the, the watchmanship and, and how the NPs collectively take on that burden for humanity? Yeah, so so all of the NPs, I mean, NESI users as a whole are responsible for extrapolating off of the things that they go to go through to understand the potential of what could happen. Um, yeah. And so as we're going through our lives and experiencing hardships, and NPs especially because we don't really have um, – high SE, accessible SE, to be able to navigate in the moment, we kind of operate off of, uh, we try to operate off of prep work, um, trying to understand what's going to happen and, and account for that. Um, it's really hard for us to, to um, we, we've made the analogy hundreds of times, but SI in the context of this system is a lot like the hard drive in a computer. It, it's long-term storage. Uh, it's a personal data point, um, whereas SE is kind of like random access memory. And with the RAM, RAM is organizing information as it processes in and then decides where to store it. Um, later. Later, right. Mm -hmm. And so for the NPs that are low RAM, we, we're kind of wired to kind of look at these patterns as in order to kind of try to prevent these pitfalls of, that we're going through. Well, and I love that you bring up pitfalls because that this is one of the, in my opinion, the most compelling reason why he's an INTP is because his consequential awareness is, is through the roof. It's that any parent is so precise, is so perceptive. Uh, yeah. I, INFJs are not as perceptive about society as a whole. They can they can cultivate that, but the but the INTPs are that is kind of their job to be the, these these owls, right? These ardents. That's why Chase chose one of the reasons he he chose that as the INTP's kind of archetype uh, symbol. So for Jordan Peterson, the, this consequential awareness, his his rise to fame, I believe it was in big part due to um, him sharing his warnings of hey this is where we're going and he him being someone who has absorbed and studied and discovered all the all the history that that he's looked at in the past he sensed he saw these same patterns moving us that are still moving us towards what he believes is a destructive outcome so he's trying to steer away from that and then i think secondarily steer towards something more prosperous which which honestly brings us to another point i'm gonna initiate here but um yeah i mean you, going through learning how to type i'm starting to realize one of the vectors that as you start to understand the temples one of the the vector that it is a vector that is fairly quick to spot and so I want to talk about that for a minute. And Jordan Peterson is part of the body temple. Um, INPPs, ENTJs, um, ISFPs, and ESFJs. And the whole theme to that temple, of course, is legacy. Personal legacy, collective legacy. Um, you know, this is what makes up that purpose discovery or purpose and discovery making up legacy. Um, versus if he was an INFJ, which would be Soul Temple character, right? Who people are. He, hmm. if you listen to him debate, he really does not care to go into people's character. He tries to avoid it. He dislikes hmm. other people talking about character as well. He's trying to look at the information. Um, and that's that's another thing that you can really look at. If you look at any of the Soul Temple, um, they are always talking about who somebody is. You got the ISTJ like pulling from stories, like iconic characters to be able to pull from their library of Alexandria to be able to pass on to other people. Um, ENFPs are constantly trying to connect people to each other, the right person for the right job, um, so on and so forth. You know, um, INFJs and ESTPs looking for people of high character that they can be around and incorporate into their wolf pack. Um, and if you really pay attention to what Peterson is going on about continuously, it's it's not about um, the the primary there. It, it's not about who people are. That's that's very 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 secondary. It's about what are we leaving behind for the future? Where are we heading? Kind of like you were bringing up. And 
just from a macro standpoint of just the four sides of the mind collectively, I think that's a really big indicator. And you can see, I, I love that you bring up the body temple because he's he's very interesting because if you've, if you've watched enough of him, you can uh, remember a few examples of how staunchly he often defends tradition of saying, hey, you know, tradition may not be perfect, but it's certainly better than just throwing it to the wind and, and hoping that we're going to land on, land on something better. And I think his ESFJ subconscious is actually quite a guardian of tradition in some way, especially as the body temple, all four types, you know, their God function, which is a little advanced, but is, is introverted sensing. It's, pres it's preserving, trying to preserve the standards of the, of the past, what is valuable in the yeah. past. And I think part of his warning to us is to not, you know, not mindlessly throw away our heritage as spotted as it may be because why be because our future is going to be worse be because of that that's the connection between si and e right yep. so for peterson being an intp that first thing of the huge consequential awareness and the body temple uh kind of the subtlety of the body temple pressing through his communication and what he cares about that's kind of the first reason and then the other reasons are kind of more vector related he's definitely informative and this can be tricky sometimes especially for the two ntp types they're both informative but they have ti so sometimes they can seem direct because they're making logical statements of this is this this is that this is that this is not this but if you see peterson when he's relaxed he's all about providing a lot of information and he's talking and talking and talking and sharing stories and anecdotes and this is the the classic sign of being informative versus being direct, which is always being cursed and you know uh, short with your speech. You, so. you know what's you know what's really what really interesting, and this isn't like this isn't a super like advanced pattern or anything like that. Sure. I found it interesting sure. when you brought up that you know NPs are are the watchers, right? Right. Isn't it funny that there's one from each temple? Mm. You have the INTPs, which are watchers of legacy. Perfect example, right. Jordan Peterson. You have in ENTPs, watcher of people's hearts, right? Right. The flame. I mean, Chase's, like, his slogan is basically turning, you know, the hearts of the people hearts back. Of to their, yeah, to right. Their, yeah. Um, yeah. ENFPs is, is looking out and watching for people's character, their souls, and trying to get people to move towards that. Where is humanity's character headed? Yeah, uh, yeah, and then INFP is watching our our education, our learning. Right. Um, Alan Watts is a fantastic example of this, but yes. you can also get a layer deeper too, in a way, and talk about the Forty Eight Laws of Power, where he's talking right. about influence and how the Mind Temple is really, really fixated on. Okay, are people valid in their authority? Right. Yeah. And that, that you're, those two origins uh, refining each other. Correct. Yeah. And so it's just fascinating. You you have one NP, one watcher for each of these temples. Um, so I wanted to bring that up as a footnote being yeah. the starter type. Well, that I it, it, it's interesting when you, when you look at Alan Watts versus Robert Greene of how how differently they go about their watching for education and yeah. and mind templeness. So I, I recommend people if you haven't checked both of them out, look at both of them and then do kind of a side-by-side -side comparison of how, how differently two types can, of the same type can go about, you know, accomplishing their, their bigger goal. So um, as far as Peterson, back to Peterson, why he's INTP, that discovery origin is, is so apparent. The, he's informative. The consequential awareness is just, is supreme. It, it's, yeah. it's really an apex consequential awareness and his whole purpose as far as I can tell, is, is about steering humanity towards a better consequence. Uh, next, we talked about him being informative. He's always supplying information, especially when he's relaxed. I know you can find interviews where he's being stressed and is more curt and to the point, but when he's relaxed, he's all about supplying information, all about his anecdotes, all about his stories. That's the classic informative uh, vector. And then his TI is just his supercomputer, right? The INFJ's TI child can always go, 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 but the INTP's is working at like this this super abstract level and it's just constantly churning out uh complex information right and he can just if you watch him live he's just he's just churning and processing and processing in a pretty yep. uh it's a constant way that's the ti hero right that's what they that is their hammer yeah um 
And then lastly, uh, he's systematic. He's systematic AF, right? He's, he's all about optimizing systems. He's so aware of systems. Uh, and also, he has, he has way too much extroverted thinking to be an INFJ. He's pretty good at planning from what we can tell. He's pretty good at structuring, organizing things. Maybe not as naturally as like an ENTJ would, but he can, he can do it certainly a lot more than an INFJ would who always have INFJ struggle with, with, with that. Well, not only that, he you can see in his interviews, he can genuinely see what the other person is thinking. He can see the structure that they're processing with as they are trying to formulate their their arguments. And so, like, that is one thing that INFJs tend to struggle with is INFJs will project their own thinking onto other people. Peterson doesn't do that. He's listening and observing how they're putting together their information in order for him to process and try to get them on the same page as him. Um, so yeah, and the systematic point is is fantastic because you have INFJs that are triple triple interest. It's really yeah, triple only about the <laughs> right, right. It's it's about the exceptions to every single rule. Whereas Jordan Peterson is trying to create an overall system for doing things for living life. Literally, twelve rules for life. That if you if you if people if you guys in the audience are having trouble understanding systematic versus interest, twelve rules for life is systematic in a nutshell it is trying to create a system of behavior to make your life easier one size fits all this is what everybody should be doing this is the most effective way to do this thing whereas that's the, interest, the most effective way i love that that that's exactly it whereas interest is looking at the exceptions this is the most effective for this situation right for this for this person or and so uh, this is one reason why INFJs can be really good at helping individuals, individual people. And it goes into line with character focus, right? So they are looking at that person as is through their personal, that that's their situation. What is their interest in this matter? Um, or conversely, what's my interest in this matter? But um, I digress. That That's kind of the difference there between systematic and interest. So. Um, just for those that might struggle with it, I know that I did for a long time when I was first learning this system and this information. Well, it, and, and that's why it's important to to point in multiple vectors to show why he's an INTP because the, the systematic is easier to digest when you're already on board with, oh, okay, he's an any user, right? So yeah. any user, consequential awareness, informative, super high TI, uh, the cognitive kind of origin of discovery, systematic, and I love that, that you bring up the listening point because that goes directly into what we're going to next, which is talking about his octogram. And the reason why he is, one of the reasons why he's such a supreme listener is because of his octogram and because he is UD, we, we believe he's UDSF, ENTJ developed, it's his ENTJ shadow, ESFJ focused in his ESFJ subconscious. So before we dig into him specifically, can you give us kind of a thematic overlay of what the UDSF variant means, what what the hope, what the archetype theme of the hope uh, means to you, and kind of what the journey of the UDSF type uh, or variant is? Yeah. Uh, so for the octogram. So I'm going to walk through starting from UDUF and work my way up. Sure. Through the through the variants here. Very systematic um, of your interest, uh, interest boy over there. Right. Right. Uh, you know, ISTJ subconscious coming soon. Right. Um, <laughs> Please. Don't. But um, I just want to show the the kind of gradient that yeah. we're talking about here. Yeah. So, UDUF unconscious developed, unconscious focused. Um, we're talking about somebody. If you take the entire eight function stack and break it down the middle, right? You have your top four functions, which are your ego functions, and your bottom bottom four functions, which are your shadow functions. Um, right. You have the top functions are more natural to the state of mind. The reason why it's broken here is due to orbit. So I'm an any hero. That means an I is in my shadow um, because I'm preferring the 
extroverted variant of intuition over the introverted variant. That's why this gets broken up the way that it does down the halfway point. Um, so we are more naturally equipped or it, it is we get gain more energy out of using the top four functions because it is the preferences. Um, and there's there are some um, there are a few asterisks on this, but for simplicity's sake, I'll, I'll keep it to that. Yeah. Um, and so if you have somebody that grows up and when they're a child, their four ego functions are not accepted. They're, um, they're, it, they don't feel like they can be within their ego naturally. They're going to use the other tools in the toolbox. They're going to go to their shadow. Um, and if that's effective, um, then they'll use those temporarily. If you have a situation where kind of no matter what the social group that they go to, everywhere they kind of are going, they can't seem to get their ego to fit in. Um, you end up over time having somebody that is unconscious developed and unconscious focused. So this is somebody that has not been able to stay in their ego at all, realistically. Right. They go right. back there in, you know, maybe in solitude, but th you can only do that so often. We're social creatures. Um, even if you're an introvert, I don't care if you sit at home and you just are bundled up all day long, you're still a social creature, you're still suffering right. from to some degree. Um, so can we can we say that in broad terms that both UD variants have experienced environments where their ego was just not welcome, not not supported, not allowed to 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 grow, yes, or be energized. And so, okay. so what ends up happening is you end up with despair for UD UF types um, because. The top half of the stack is more energizing to use. You get more energy from it because it is your bias, your natural bias. Um, you end up drained, um, spending long times in this bottom half of the stack, and you end up resenting, a lot of people end up resenting their ego functions. This is what UDUF looks like. And so it can be incredibly difficult for them to get back to the to where they should be um, with their natural biases. Not all biases are a terrible thing. <laughs> We can't spend life perpetually growing. That that would that would be miserable. We do need breaks occasionally. Um, some people might roll their eyes at that, but that's okay. Um, now, from there, you have the UD SF types. Now, these are types that they have found preference in the bottom half of the functions. Now, oftentimes this is from a very similar starting point where their ego functions weren't initially um, accepted, um, but their shadow functions became a very powerful tool for them. Um, but they haven't let go of the ego functions. They're, they're learning to come back and incorporate that ego and they're finding energy and happiness um, in doing so, because it's like, okay, now, cool, I have all eight of these tools at my disposal, but I'm, I'm really learning to use what I'm naturally um, better at um, to my advantage. Um, and so that's the UDSF, and that can start for, for a varying degree of reasons. And then we can flip over. We have the SDUF types. Uh, and SDSF is starting from a place where in childhood, they either, their family, um, or maybe they found a friend group was uh, really accepting of their ego functions to the point sure. that they were actually able to overcome um, that kind of in inferior inhibition and actually aspire with that inferior function. Um, but they, were running into, they still were running into problems where they had to rely on the other tools and toolkit um, to kind of solve. So you life. said SDSF, you mean SDUF, right? Uh, SDUF, excuse me, yes, SDF. yes. So who were enabled early, but then later had to... to had to the access the rest of the tools in the toolkit. Yeah, they had right. situations in their life where they still valued that, that lower uh, half of the function stack. They were still able to kind of go, oh, okay, I still need these, these other tools. I... I, I can't just get away with just my ego functions. Um, right. And then, you know, process of elimination, we got SDSF. 
which is an extreme form of enablement. Um, they were allowed to just kind of run wild um, to some degree. Um, they didn't really get a lot of um, challenges that the ego couldn't overcome. And it's not so much that, oh, they didn't go through anything. Because you can still have SDSF types that went through something, but their right. ego tools were appropriate for whatever they were going through. They they were right. able to kind of deal with whatever life threw at them with while remaining in those ego functions. Um, the issue there is the longer that goes on, eventually you're going to hit a wall that's really going to hurt the longer this goes on, where at some point you know, the four top four functions are not going to cut it and life is going to hit you really hard. Um, and because you haven't really practiced with those other tools, you're going to be ill-equipped. Um, and so this doesn't necessarily mean that, you know, there's a preferable uh, octogram, in my opinion. It's just kind of the way life plays out. Every single one of these variants has different hurdles that they kind of have to go through or get over. Um, cause the yeah. mind eventually wants integration between all, all four sides. Right. And all variants have a humanitarian value, which we'll get to soon. So I'm, we're writing an article, I'm writing an article on these four themes that Elliot came up with and Chase has been using and that we've, we've all been, been using since of uh, hope, joy, decay, despair for the variants. So yeah. for Peterson, we believe he's UDSF, you know, a, a challenging upbringing, uh, the, in, an environment that kind of forced him to be a little more willful to really dig into research with the ENTJ shadow, the ENTJ nemesis and an eye critic uh, to kind of learn learn to cultivate uh, more of a uh, the the ENTJ shadow is influenced by the mind temple when it's in the you know the INTP ego is the body temple the ENTJ shadow is the mind temple so uh, his shadow his ENTJ sh side 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 is is about intellectual curiosity which we'll get to even more so momentarily so Going back to what you said a little earlier about you know him being really a really effective listener, his ability to discern what people are thinking is in part due to the development of his TE nemesis in his ENTJ shadow. I imagine maybe in, in his family or early environment, maybe other people's thoughts were more you know listened to than his own, or maybe he had to be a source of desire, uh, maybe for his parents or, or for teachers or whoever else than actually be the one who was desired all the time. Um, any other general insights for the UDSF INTP before we dig a little deeper here? No, I think I think we hit the nail on the head there, personally. Um, okay. yeah. So for their, for their temple wheel, UDSF means uh, generativity or hedonism plus generativity, right? Hedonism is the UD pole. And gen and generativity is is the SF pull, um, subconscious focus through being generative. So, for hedonism, I I mentioned that that it's you know it's the ENTJ shadow, the mind temple shadow. Yes, the hedonism is also the mind temple pull because they they're the same thing. Saying saying someone has an ENTJ shadow and saying that that they're developed into the hedonistic pull is 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 synonymous, right? Yeah. So what hedonism means, being a, of the mind temple, it's about curiosity. It's not. It's also about pleasure in some way, but it's it's even more so. It has it has this mind temple flavor to it, where it's about inspiring curiosity in, in others or pursuing your own curiosity. It has a more intellectual uh, uh, curiosity to it. And I think for Peterson, it's it's really hard to say he's not that. I mean, his whole life has been about from his own uh, mouth has has been about him following his interest into the intellectual frame of a, 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 researching a huge diversity of topics, right? mythology, religion, science, psychoanalysis, uh, history, yep. politics, economics, all these things, right? That is, is uh, for an INTP, a classic example of what hedonism looks like. It's this, it's this uh, can't get enough curiosity. I need to look and look and look and, and discover where uh you know where where my curiosity leads me basically yeah and uh so that's the hedonism side pole of, of this mind temple influence of what makes me curious i'm gonna go search out right and then generativity before you know, before there? yeah before we move on to generativity yeah, um with with hedonism the other thing about it is 
because they understand that kind of desire towards curiosity, so to speak, um, right. they understand the level that people can get to in chasing kind of carnal things, which um, if, if we're taking kind of the more like layman's idea of like hedonistic behavior where it's abandoning all abandoning all morals and all principles in favor of that like experience and that pleasure if you listen to a lot of his lectures he projects that onto a ton of other people and i think that's because he sees that capacity within himself and to be fair, there are a lot of people out there that are very hedonistic as well. Right. No one's no one's spared entirely from from the pull of, of right. But he of, understands of the very intimately, like his own the dangers that are there with hedonism because he right. deals with those temptations himself, and yeah. he sees other people. He projects with SE Trickster a little bit that other people are going to be naturally undisciplined. And so if you combine kind of that projection that other people are going to be undisciplined by default with his understanding of his own, you know, hedonistic desires, um, if they were to run wild, it really makes sense out of a lot of the things that he is preaching against and a lot of the kind of uh, fervor that he applies in 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 preaching in crusading um right. excuse the little bit of pun there within the system but yeah, the crusading against against this these these uh hedonistic tendencies um that is part of what the intp is watchful for intps when at their worst can become the embodiment of that as well of right. the person that is trying to make everybody abandon morals for the sake of a good time it's so interesting here because when you listen to him talk about his his past he talks about how much how many cigarettes he used to smoke growing up and he was in his early 20s i think and he drink drink a lot of alcohol and then he was the skinny kind of kind of gaunt tall uh young adult and then he he talks about how he decided one day like okay i i need to i need to chill on the drinking and the smoking and and the partying and let's let's go discipline myself right so he talks about how he started working out and he talked about when he went to the to the gym he had no idea what he was doing he needed someone else to help him you know lift the 20 pounds that yeah. that he could muster uh, which is also kind of an SE trickster thing of, of needing people to kind of demonstrate to you how to how to do some kind of basic things. But then he said, you know, his his work ethic started to grow, and this is sort of the the path for INTPs, especially SF INTPs, where their uh, SI child, their childlike discipline or undisciplined, depending, becomes responsible in the subconscious when they become these sort of uh, you know. Uh, uh, I want to say that we're crusader again for discipline, but they become parental and strong and reliable with their discipline. And I think as far as projection goes, he's also projecting that journey onto other people of, you know, you all have childlike discipline and you need this parental discipline. Yep. Whereas I, I think that was certainly his own journey from, uh, you know, early adulthood onwards. Yeah. Um, so that's the hedonism pull. That's the ENTJ shadow, the research, the willpower. Um, also, doubly systematic uh well i guess the esfj side is also systematic but systematic more in an inventive way of the emtj shadow uh most inventors who are intps are ud because the the entj shadow is good at at uh abstract systematizing as the intp ego is and they become really really good at, at bringing in new new systems to the world whereas the esfj subconscious is systematic but they're about kind of more maintaining or improving existing systems, right? I um, I want to touch on that too. Um, please, yeah. Yeah, so, and this, this pertains more to ENTJs. Um, I think, I think there is a, a negative reaction to, for them, for ENTJs uh, having that greed poll, but this is one example where greed is only bad when it's like kind of excessive. But what the purpose that it's trying to serve, and all of these, all of these deadly sins serve a, a a purpose of kind of protection of the person initially, um, and they're very often they go too far. But there are 
there were probably countless people through history who had all the ideas, but not enough greed to ensure that they were the ones in control mm -hmm. of the production of their ideas. Um, and when somebody doesn't exert that control like that, their ideas fall into other people's hands. It gets misused or abused. Maybe it goes in a completely different direction. The originator of the of the idea is no longer the person in control of it. Mm -hmm. And so oftentimes, you know, these UD INTPs are exercising enough control over their own um, inventions um, to make sure that it stays with them and they can see it through to completion to ensure their own legacy. That insurance of their own legacy is also what drives them to continue to improve it. So, And that's sort of the classic example of someone like Nikola Tesla, who, at least by report, kind of got a lot of credit taken from taken away from from him because he had, you know for whatever reason he didn't seem to be able to to preserve his actual con contribution to the original invention so uh, for peterson that ud uh, hedonism poll and then the sf living virtue generative poll so you know as far as generativity versus gluttony this man is insanely generative. It's it's absolutely ridiculous if you even know half the things he's he's doing. All the applications, all the tests he's made, all the websites, uh, the lectures, the courses, the years of being a therapist, uh, podcaster. He's, he just started a podcast, this huge podcast, after he was over being sick and interviews tons of people, these long explorations. Uh, articles, books, and he's making an online university. <laughs> you know, it, it that's crazy. And, and amidst all the other things that I'm sure we don't know that he's also doing, this man is ridiculously gen generative. It's not even, to me, it's not really even a discussion point in terms of what he leads with more for most of his life, as far as we, you know, the the public is aware of it. He's he has his hands in so many pies, he's producing so many things, bringing new things into into the works, and not to mention his his tours where he's you know, uh, giving a talk every other night or something across the world. Uh, this this man, I don't, I can't think of anyone who was more generative than 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 he is. So, um, yeah. Do you do you have some insight for us on no. generativity or, or anything? No, else? you hit the nail on the head with that. Um, I I the, the biggest thing I was gonna say is just like, I think. You know, we've been talking about the side pulls a little bit here, um, particularly, um, but, well, particularly the um, hedonism. But, hedonism pull. Right. Yeah, but. The, Surveillance is the other pull, which we'll get to in a second. Right. Um, these, the, the living virtue and the deadly sin pulls, um, right. they're a lot more, they feed into each other a lot more. Yes. Um, right. So. What you can end up with is consuming and then producing and then consuming and producing. And I think that when he went through his kind of um, his phase where he thought he was dying, I think there was a phase there where he went into um, his his deadly sin of gluttony, uh, threw himself into trying to figure out a way to um, get out of it. And through that, that, that success that he had in climbing out of that, I think really just accelerated the growth of his subconscious when he came out of it. Because for somebody to go through like the acceptance, of, okay, I'm probably going to die. And then they find that way out. Um, you see it very frequently. All of a sudden they <laughs> found new purpose, right? Um, and so, the, the, right, I love that. Emerging from the shadow origin where purpose exists to perpetuate more discovery. Yeah. Uh, and so, so I think so, he flew hard into that generativity um, okay. following that. And this is why, like, he suddenly just started absolutely crusading against all of these things that he's seeing as completely wrong with the world. It's like, I have this second chance. I have a responsibility. I have a duty. I have to exercise this duty responsibly and make sure that we have a future. 
And I think he just absolutely threw himself full, full speed at his subconscious. I think, I suspect he was UDSF even before that. Um, but I think that really kicked it into high gear. I think this is why a lot of people are seeing him as like more of a high FE user um, than, right. than a high Especially gear. Especially recently, user. right? Yeah. Um, and, and for those who, who don't know, I imagine most, most people know, but a, a couple of years ago, he almost died and was ex extremely sick. And his wife almost died during that same time. I, I believe she had cancer. And he had to go to some treatment center in Russia, I think, after they tried a bunch of other places. And he was just, he was, he was not doing well at all, but he's obviously alive still. So uh, I, I want to come back to that point in a couple of minutes uh, when we go into the superego part of the octogram. So <clears throat> one more point on the, gener on the generativity. You talk about the consumption to production. Now, it's certainly the point that he's used the gluttony, right? He used the consumption a lot in his life. That man has read so much, done so much, seen so many places. That is the the consuming uh, uh, part of the wheel, right? And I think I think of all the types, uh, in my opinion, the INTP and ESFJ's wheel, the relationship between the deadly sin and the living virtue is is. Uh, very clear in terms of how they work together. You have to consume in order to create. When you're lacking in ideas, you need to breed more. You need to consider more. You need to see, you need, you need to experience more new things, right? And then that can perpetuate fuel for the creative fire, right? Yep. Um, and the way I define generativity is creative productivity. It kind of has this, this original tinge to it in terms of, it's not just showing up, right? It's it's bringing your whole self, bringing your body of experience to discover something new for whatever task you're, you know, you're working on or have been assigned to, right? Yep. So uh, when we say he's UDSF and he's hedonism and generativity, it's not saying he doesn't use gluttony or doesn't use servility. We'll get to that in a second. But that he uses those uh, kind of for the purpose of, of, of generativity and purpose for following his curiosities, right? Um, so... We believe his UDSF ENTJ developed uh, ESFJ focus. And on the ESFJ focus piece, this is the next point I want to push into is uh, the public persona of Jordan Peterson is very servile, uh, servile, I think. People think of him uh, as someone who is servile, as someone who is wanting to serve others and to, and to bring his service about. Yeah. So um, I'm not saying this isn't true, but I think he's giving off more of an image of the person he's trying to become rather than kind of the roots into where he's grown. So uh, can you talk a little bit about that relationship between you know, how people perceive him and what you think is actually going on with this, with the subconscious focus, uh, the ESFJ side? Yeah. So I think that um, with uh when it comes to the hedonism versus the servility, um, as I said before, I think there is an extremely strong push following his near-death experience um, that is a little outside the norm for a, a transition um, from like UDUF to UDSF. In the sense that he had such a heavy like when, when you have to sit there and accept that you're going to die um and you're fighting against that and then you finally come out the other side of that and you survive you you get your life back essentially for him i think that there is a stronger push towards moving towards subconscious development from unconscious development i don't think he's there um, by any means, um, but I think that society is kind of pushing him that way, almost, right. because he is, as, as we made the joke before, he is going on this crusade to kind of um, end what he sees as, like, catastrophic for our society, um, for humanity, and so he's really trying to change kind of the, um, the hearts of other people through that ESFJ subconscious, th through aspiring through FE Hero and trying to motivate people to not 
make these choices that they're making. Um, this is where a lot of the emotion comes in. Again, for the body temple, aspiration is the heart temple. Um, and it's that passion. And so... <laughs> the One thing I will say about, about him, I think he's always been good at cultivating that intrigue of the heart temple in others. And I, th I think that's yeah. evidence for the, the, the SF portion, that heart temple, the way he appeals to people is in part with, with the passion, right, of, of what you could be, of, of this. Uh, it, it's not just about knowledge, right, or information. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, if you if you go back and look at a lot of his like lectures and things like that, where he's not in a like interview and a debate, and before he started getting like massively slandered, basically, right. um, accused of all of these things. Um, yes, I, I agree. He was using that um, that ESFJ side as as you described it, kind of more trying to fan the flames. Um, right. Whereas now especially with like the way that the media is kind of turned on him. Now he's trying to really embody that. And it, it really is stoking his own like kind of uh, flames and his own passion. Right. He's getting absolutely emotional um, in these debates. So one of the things that you brought up when we were preparing for this uh, discussion was about how, how his stance now, uh, I, I think, in relation to like the the trans issue and like surgery for 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 children to to get s sex changes, one of his kind of more recent sort of wrathful things is appealing to that uh, you know to not allowing doctors to do that without necessarily you know going on his way to supply all the scientific literature and, and all that. He'll he'll do that still, but it's more about the moral stances. It's, it's it's more about the the heart temple protective stance of the ESFJ sub subconscious and less about, well, if we just educate people the right way, they'll change their minds. He, he's, he's, he's still trying to educate, right? But it's much more about, I'm going to stand here and over my dead body, this is going to happen, right? Yeah. That's more of the release, letting go of some of that TI, TE stuff and pushing more into the FE, SI of the ESFJ subconscious, right? Yeah. Um, so uh, for his type, uh, I think the subconscious focus has been there for for a long time. He's he's been, uh, uh, you know, a clinician, a therapist, having to sit with people and help them for hours and hours and hours, uh, which leads us to kind of the final point of of his uh, of this UDSF discussion of someone's focus and development are kind of relative to their own life experience. So, for example, uh, if he's UDSF focus on developing his subconscious you can take you know a, a 15 or 20 year old intp who is sdsf yep. and peterson probably still has a more developed esfj side than yep. an sdsf type right it's still kind of relative i mean he's yep. he's his roots are still deep in his esfj side even though his his octogram home is more his his shadow right yeah um so that's the that's the last point on on the base discussion of his octogram. Anything more to add be, be, before we move to the superego discussion? No, it's still octogram related technically. So no, okay. Mm -hmm. So did you, just to sum up, UDSF, IN, INTP, uh, moving, moving, aspiring constantly for that ESFJ subconscious. One one thing I, I will add to, if you look at the guidance function for the INTP ego, right, mm -hmm. SI child. If I discover as much as I can, if I experience as much as I can, if I can gather as much information as I am capable of, that allows me to guide my FE inferior to help people as much as possible. And that's how the guidance function of SI child becomes the guidance into the subconscious where the FE aspirational can really, really express itself. So the last point of our discussion here is about bringing up that near-death experience but also talking about ISFP superego because for me, after he escaped his near-death experience, he kind of came back after he got a little healthier with this sort of almost vindictiveness at times, this sort of wrathfulness towards certain movements. Um, and if you're not familiar with that, you can I'm sure you can find that on his on his channel. But I, I think part of it was the the surgery thing that I mentioned. So I think that's part of uh, FI demon. This is what I value. This is what I care about. This is what I know is good. This is what I know is bad. Yeah. Allowing him to start to make a value judgment 
in combination with his TI hero, pincering FE inferior, uh, inferior right in the middle, where it's like, we're going to change social norms because my FID and my NTI hero are both siphoning through my FE inferior to, uh, to transform what people value. So can you tell us a little bit about, uh, kind of a, a, in a general sense, what ISFP superego, what the ISFP soul temple superego is, what it's looking for, and how it's trying to tie in the INTP's kind of growth to path to integration. Yeah. So with the ISFP superego, so a lot of times, so for TI heroes, they are spending more time looking at what is what what makes sense more so than how they personally feel about it. Right. Um, exactly. they're, they're, the morality of it for them is not as important as the truth of the situation. Um, and the, the general trend with FI demons is that they kind of go through this, I don't personally feel a certain way, I don't personally feel a certain way, I don't personally feel a certain way, and then all of a sudden it's like, oh, I have to feel some kind of way about it. I, I, abs I have to feel some kind of way about this. Um, and so it's that, um, it's that moment of, well, a lot of times for INTPs, it's like, my children are going to, like, this is very commonly the way it ends up playing out. My children are going to suffer because of you people. Right. You, and, and that's yes. that soul temple influence, who you guys are, your, your absolutely poor character is ruining everything, and the things that I actually value, that I've given up for trying to help everybody else, suddenly the things that I value are not important to anyone. And that ISFP superego goes, well, what about the people that I am leaving behind? What about the people that are important to me? Right. And um, so that's where that FI demon starts to just come in full force like a tidal wave. Um, and yeah, you're exactly right. All of a sudden, his FI inferior is pinned between a rock and a hard place. And uh, it kind of becomes a sink or swim. And this is kind of how he initially rose to, to uh, popularity in the, in the beginning was opposing the, uh, I think it's the C-16 or C-17 bill. I think, I think it's the C-16 bill in, in Canada for legislating, uh, you know, gender neutral speech, uh, yeah. as far, or not gender neutral, but, you know, that, that, that whole issue. Uh, so it kind of started with the social norms, but now it's like he's doubled down. There's like there's a certain wrath to it, which I think comes from that super, that soul temple side, right, of, uh, this is not right, right? Yeah. And uh, for uh, him, I, one of the things I talked about in, in the article, which we'll, which we'll link here too, is trying to understand how the superego has influenced him in terms of where his work is going to go in the future, and in some cases has already started to affect. So he, he recently published a book, I think it was last year, called uh, the ABCs of Childhood Tragedy. And it's very artistic. It's a very expressive piece. It's not about supplying information. It's not about educating in terms of, you know, uh, you know the, the Russian war or the, or the Soviet collapse or any, any of that. It's just him expressing himself. And this is, again, as you noted, as you talked about his near-death experience, this is after that. And I think his superego's ISFP side has demanded a level of moral uh, expressiveness um, on the other side of his near-death experience. So that this this book and the ISFP superego is about being expressive and telling people how you feel, what you care about. More like looking for what you care about by, by expressing. Yeah. And that the soul temple influence there uses that to find their identity, right? So I think we can keep an eye out for things that are going to be even more expressive for him in the, in the near future and not just intellectual or academic like we're used to, to seeing him, right? Yeah. Um, so uh, wow. let's see. Anything else for ICP Superego or what you see in him? No. Uh, I have one more, one more question before we, we finish here. Okay. Um, and that is, you kind of touched on this already, is, can you switch cognitive development? 
I think that a person can, um, but it requires essentially trauma. Um, now, a, a, accepting your own death, make no mistake, that is, that is traumatic. It can be. Um, I think that it has set him up into a place that if people keep pushing him, that that he, we may see a case where he actually does switch development. He's been burning into his ESFJ subconscious so hard um, that I think that is a possibility. Um, and now, and this is it's probably extru extremely rare, I would imagine, if it if it could occur, right? It's not like yeah, it's not, it's not like anyone can be like, I'm going to go change my development. It, it doesn't work no. like that. No. Right. So what 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 it requires is. You, you have to, we always say ego bias, right? Your ego biases. Ego in this term is a little misleading because it's not ego, four sides of the mind ego. It's, it, it's ego investments, right? Investments, um, right. For, for the following of what I'm going to talk about. Um, ego investments. You can have ego investments into your shadow or your ego or your subconscious or your super ego. It does not matter. Um, those are incredibly difficult to, to let go of. It's not as simple as you wake up one day and you go, I don't want to do this anymore. Like, I think most people know somebody that said that, right? Oh, I can't, I can't keep doing what I'm doing, right? I, I need to change. A lot of people have these like coming to God moments where, and sometimes they're effective, sometimes they're not, but very rarely are we talking about a level where they abandon, completely abandon what they've developed up to this point in favor of a switch of development. What that what re, what it requires is switch from UD to SD like quickly to just I mean over the course of like you know ten years yes it's possible to change from um, UD to SD but if we're talking like a quick change where like people are like, oh, I don't want to be UD anymore. I want to be uh, <laughs> SD. Like that's not going to happen for 99% of people. No, no, no. Um, and even if it does happen, it doesn't mean that they suddenly become undeveloped. It just means they stop preferring, they stop relying so much on where they were previously developed. They can yeah. rely on elsewhere. Um, yeah. And, even to do that, it's like it's not that you you abandon it and you forget, right? You still have you, you still have that life experience, but right. you invalidate um, that experience. Essentially, you say, "Well, that that experience does me no good. I I can't rely on it anymore." Um, right. And that's that's the level that it takes for a quick transition from UD to SD. Um, in Peterson's case, I think coupling the fact that he had that near-death experience and he is quite literally valuing so heavily from his F.E. Demon, F.I. Demon, his F.I. Demon is just absolutely smashing his F.E. right now to do something, to act. We may see a case where this happens in a matter of years, especially if the media keeps, you know, absolutely hammering him for it. Well, it's interesting. What One of the other things you mentioned to me when we were talking uh, a couple of days ago was uh, sometimes that FI demon can can grab the FE inferior so much that it, that is the thing that that causes the switch in, in development if it if if it can happen that they need to start prioritizing social change so much that it's not really it's not really about the information anymore it's it's about a crisis of sorts of let me let me steer people's hearts and identities now uh to try and make this make the the social change that that you're looking for so um yeah very exciting stuff uh the, the only last thing i'll say is this um i think it's i have no idea how much he suffered right i i don't think anyone really really does from the outside but i know it went on for years and he talks about how he you know when he got up in the morning he couldn't do anything for four or six hours and he could by the end of the day, he was barely starting to, to, to feel functional. And psychologically, I, I'm so compelled of what that does to someone 
with their superego, of, of driving them deeper into that darkness, that desperation, that despair, yeah. or he probably was U D U F for a portion of time, because that's often survival mode, right? Yep. Um, and I think what's exciting for me, watching him and, and, and observing him more recently, is just kind of seeing how the FI is flavoring throughout his work. And there's certain nuggets that I think he's brought back from his own sort of personal abyss. He, he literally he is, found what he valued. <laughs> he found what he valued. And, and he's, I think, going to start to share that more and start to steer and make his generativity a little bit more about bringing about uh, the, the value piece to it, of what, what he actually cares, cares about. So I agree. Anyway, I, I think part of that is my, my sympathy for, for him, someone who has dealt with so much and has been through so much. And uh, I am, I for one am, am, am glad that he's still, you know, still uh, here with us today. So uh, I think that's all I have. Do you have any, any last, last comments? Um, yeah. So I just want to say for anybody that's watching this, that we, we do read comments. We do try to reply to them. If you still, I don't think we've fully, obviously, convinced everybody that thinks he's an INJ. Sure. My hope is that awesome. for you guys, right? My hope is that if you are disagreeing, like first things first, are you disagreeing based on how we're how how the system our system is defining this type? Um, and if you are, um, then I hope that you know, kind of the system, the way we explain the system helps kind of ease that confusion. If you are wanting to, there isn't much we can do about, oh, well, according to this outside systems information, he's this type. Well, we're going to have to agree to disagree on that. Those are two different systems. And he may very well be that type. I can't say that you're wrong about that based on that system. Um, but if you disagree based on this system and you have some information and you want to say, oh, well, based on this vector and this vector, I actually think that. Let's have that conversation. I'd be curious to see what 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 your what your thoughts are. Um, but other than that, he's, one of the reasons we're making this video is because he's so complicated, right? It's not it, it's yeah. not like it's necessarily self self evident. So yeah, please tell us what you think. Um, and uh, also, if you guys want to learn more about the Octogram, we're doing a membership series right now, season thirty two, that we're about eighty percent through um, on each type's Octogram. Or Chase is talking about the four variants in de in great detail. Um, and so if you want to explore that, we'll link the portal there uh, if you guys want to sign up for that. We're nearing the end. We'll talk about the IN INTP by the end of the summer. And uh, that's sort of the part of the cutting edge for what we have on the Octogram. The other true cutting edge, though, is in the masterclass that Chase and I just did for uh, EYF. The masterclass of EYF is solely dedicated to the Octogram, to all these advanced kind of the cutting edge pieces of the octogram some of which we couldn't talk about today because that's what we talk that we talk about in the master class so if you guys want to be on that cutting edge of the octogram uh we'll we'll link the eyf master class here as well so and lastly just for jordan peterson himself uh thank you for for being alive so that we can uh talk about you uh thank you for existing from a soul temple perspective and i know for myself just the you know you guys been uh, uh a benefit in my life so Thank you all for joining us, Chris. Thanks for thanks for being on this call. This was awesome. And, yeah, thanks for uh, having me, man. Well, I guess I guess one last little thing. Yeah, stay tuned. If it in you there, guys, please. this is this is something new that John and I are doing, guys. If you guys enjoyed this, let us know, and we'll keep yeah. we'll keep doing these meetings, keep doing these uh, these sessions where we you know pick a type and kind of psychoanalyze and like break it down at, at length this way. Um, so if you guys really enjoyed this, let us know um, so that we know that you guys want more of this. Yeah, for sure. Awesome. Well, thank you guys for tuning in and uh, we look forward to interacting with you guys in the comments and uh, until next time. See you guys later.